So this is Sri Ran Varnsi uh, Ila Pakurti. Uh, he works at Walmart Global Tech right now as a senior software engineer uh, focused on building systems at scale. Uh, the title of his topic is Python in Hardware and Embedded Systems, a Deep Dive. Um, he has eight years of software engineering experience. He's a senior software engineer. Uh, he's worked at Meta and uh, Maxim, uh, building distributed systems. His hobby is embedded systems and electronics. Hey, hi. Thank you. So yeah, hi, hi everyone. Welcome to my talk, essentially. So my idea is to uh, essentially explore and uh, deep dive into how Python is being used in like hardware and uh, embedded systems, essentially. So Python is seen as a language which is like high level. Essentially, it's only being used for like data science or like essentially scripting and everything. So there's a lot of things happening in Python which you can use it in like embedded systems and access hardware, and then you can bring all the uh, uh, all the good things which can happen in scripting language to hardware, and then essentially make good things happen actually. So yeah, I am software engineer with eight years of experience. So I've uh, I've worked on software throughout the stack. Essentially, I've written assembly code. I've written C code. I've um, I've written Python, and then I've worked on websites running thousands of uh, thousands of nodes. Essentially, so these are some of the projects which I built on the side. Essentially, one is a quadcopter, which is pretty pretty crude, and the other is like a bipedal robot, uh, which has a couple of uh, servos for like different degrees of motion and everything. So the agenda is to introduce you to embedded systems. We'll talk about MicroPython. That's the new thing, um, or like the old thing. And then we'll talk about the, some of the tools. Uh, how easy is it to program microcontrollers? Some of the trade-offs that we see with using a scripting language or like a native language like C. We'll also talk a little bit about Circuit Python. That's also exciting. We'll also talk about some of the interesting Python libs and things which can make uh, working in hardware and uh, Python exciting. So what are embedded systems, right? Embedded systems are like, uh, are like small systems which are embedded in everything. Essentially, they are part of like a bigger system. For example, there are like many examples. Uh, if you take a car, right? A car can have like uh, tens of embedded systems. For example, a, car, a tire pressure monitoring system, right? So the tire pressure monitoring system would, would have a microcontroller. It will detect the pressure of different tires, and then it will kind of uh, inform, inform the main engine vehicle system about different things. There is ECU, there is ABS. And then there is infotainment systems, and there are like tons of other systems. If you take a house, right, there are like tons of embedded systems as well. There are thermostats, um, there are like uh, systems inside microwaves, washing machines, door locks, and a bunch of things actually. So, so let's introduce the hero of the whole thing, the microcontroller, right? So microcontroller is the main computing engine in all of the embedded systems, essentially. So annually, around 30 billion are being sold, essentially, microcontrollers alone. And then the features, the important thing about microcontrollers are like microcontrollers are like different from our server machines. They have low compute, they have memory. Oftentimes they may have some power, limited power budget, and they may be working on a on a battery powered thing actually. So some of the examples of uh, uh, extreme examples of micro of embedded systems, right? Pacemakers, like let's say a pacemaker gets implanted into a person, and then it has to last for around eight to ten years essentially. So. And then ocean oceanographic buoys or something. Essentially, these are things which are deployed on ocean to guide ships and everything. So nobody can go and uh, maintain mo maintain those buoys uh, essentially um, very often. And then remote weather stations, right? These are also like embedded systems which you, which provide us with important data. And then uh, they have to operate within constraints. Essentially, they cannot they cannot have have uh, they cannot be connected to the grid. Then they cannot have a power cord which a power cord which is powering them. So yeah, let me uh, talk about like uh, let me just give the resource constraints on embedded systems actually. So uh, uh, let's talk about let's compare uh, two distances. Actually, one is like a Raspberry Pi Pico. This is actually high-end microcontroller, and then let's compare a server. So uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, is something is a microcontroller which you can use it for embedded systems development actually. So if you compare the CPU, right, the CPU has something called a clock speed. Typically, the Raspberry Pi is running at 133 megahertz. There are like CP there are microcontrollers running at like tens of megahertz. This is the speed at which the CPU is executing the instructions and everything. Whereas the server machine is executing in the gigahertz range, essentially. There are like multiple cores, and then there are like hyper threads and a lot of action which is going on. 
if, even if you consider RAM, right, essentially we think of uh, server memory as 4 gigabytes, 8 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, and everything, whereas uh, when you compare a Raspberry Pi Pico, it's only like 264 kilobytes, essentially. So we are talking about a system which is very, very limited. <coughs> And then even if you consider operating system, right? So some of the microcontrollers can't even uh, run operating system. You cannot have, you don't have, you only have so much memory. You can, only, you can only run one program. You don't even have operating system support and everything. So that's a big problem. Uh, and then power consumption, right? So the microcontrollers have a very limited budget. So they run in like milliwatt, essentially. They do, a they do some work and then go back to sleep, essentially. If you take the server, right? The servers have to be connected to the card. They have to have giant fans running in data centers, which are like cooling and stuff. So we are like talking about two different uh, worlds altogether. So let's introduce uh, MicroPython. So essentially, MicroPython was created by an uh, Australian programmer and physicist called Damien George in 2013. So he wanted to bring the goodness of like Python to embedded systems, actually. So embedded systems has been dominated, has been dominated by the C and C++, essentially. They are like systems languages. They can interact with hardware. They're efficient. Uh, he wanted to uh, bring the goodness of scripting to, to embedded systems, essentially. So he started a Kickstarter project, and then he got funded for around 100,000 euros, and then he started working on this project. So what he did was he essentially redrawed the whole problem and re-implemented uh, C Python from scratch, optimized for microcontrollers. Essentially, so the C Python, which the traditional C Python, which we use it on our Mac and everything, is uh, very inefficient. Essentially, it pre allocates it uses a lot of RAM, it uses a lot of compute. It so essentially, so uh, even before it starts, the Python wouldn't even run any programs. Essentially, so the, C, the micro Python is a complete re implementation and essentially thinking from scratch of like the Python. Uh, thing actually, which you can use for embedded systems. So MicroPython is designed to be efficient from the ground up, essentially. So it implements Python 3.5-ish. So most of the features are there, but not every feature is, is implemented, actually. So because this is a re-implementation, right? So some of the standard libraries have to be ported to MicroPython to have them available for uh, different functions. And, uh, and then in, with MicroMyton, you don't have operating system. As I previously mentioned, you have direct access to hardware, essentially. And then MicroPython also has this function where you can hard, hardware abstraction layer, right? Where you can write Python code, and then you can uh, essentially use it on different uh, microcontrollers. You, you get this uh, portability. With C, I think uh, there are like some specific libraries for each hardware and some specific headers and everything. You just have to port and everything. And uh, the good thing is that almost 80% of the common libraries and standard libraries are supported in MicroPython. So you don't lose out on the uh, Python which you are familiar with. And then there are some nice tools to even try out, try out actually. The Raspberry Pi, uh, there, there is a simulation environment called WovKey, and then there's also a MicroPython environment where you can, uh, where you can like, write my MicroPython code in the browser itself and then connect peripherals and test out. This is a small example where a Raspberry Pi Pico is connected to an LED board, and you can write Python code to like even without buying a board and everything. And then the good thing with Python is Python gives you this repel lesson, unlike C++, right? C, 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 C++, where you have to compile, then, then download the code to a microcontroller, then execute the code, reset, and everything. So with Python, you can directly uh, connect the, you can connect the microcontroller to a USB, you can connect uh, the, the a terminal through to a serial port, and you can execute the commands like this. this. Is like crazy. I mean, like you can do all this, and then you have the other good things like the big number, like 1234. With C, you run into integer overflows and floating point and all the complexity which you have to deal with and everything. And uh, MicroPython also has this uh, great thing called MIP. Essentially, you might have heard about PIP, right? You just do PIP install this thing, and you have the packages. So MicroPython has this has a similar thing called MIP, where you can just do do MIP install, and then the package is already on the on the board. It's not even on your PC; it's on the board. Essentially, this is like crazy. On CE, you have to do change, make changes to, to make file, and then you have to compile the whole thing, bring it onto the board, and then do a reset and all that. Yeah. And then downloading code is also pretty easy, actually. So MicroPython uh, compatible microcontrollers support a file system. All you have to do is you can use any editor of your choice, write your Python code. And then you can just mount the, essentially, when you connect the uh, MicroPython board to your board, it, it, it gets enumerated as a USB drive, essentially. So you, ju you just dump your files onto the, onto, the onto, onto the Flash file system. And then, uh, and then there's also CLI where you could, uh, there's a 
command called mp remote mount and then it will just mount and then you can the files uh, magically show up on your uh, on the microcontroller so essentially all your files you need not do any complicated uh, flash writing and connections and uh, specific tools and everything essentially it's just like simple as connecting a usb drive and then there's a, a lightweight editor called Thony. So this is uh, this is famous among Python community, where it gives you the functionality of both the uh, downloading the code as well as the REPL, essentially. So both of them are also integrated into this editor. Yeah, this is like a Hello World program of uh, MicroPython. Essentially, you just import. This, this is like Python. And then you can just turn on the LED and stuff. Yeah, this is a little bit complicated example, where you, you can connect to a network and then do a get request and then uh, print the request actually. Doing this in C would be yeah, a little bit <laughs> crazy. This is all like uh, Python, which you are familiar with. These are all networking libraries. You can just do all the things which you, which you are like familiar with. Uh, and then, yeah, I try to, I try to do <laughs> in this in C, and then it gets uh, crazy really quick, actually, yeah. So let's talk about the how, how the whole thing works under the hood, right? Essentially, how does let's talk about how the uh, we are talking about REPL on 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 the Python micro Python. We're also talking about uh, um, uh, being able to just uh, load the Python files and everything, right? So how does it actually work under the hood, right? So if you typically compile a C code, right? The uh, the C code gets. Uh, uh, on, a, on a Windows machine or a Linux machine gets uh, compiled into a machine code, and then th this gets typically loaded into the hardware, and then this gets executed. So, and then C code is like direct, essentially. You can you just uh, get machine code directly, and then you execute, and then it's really quick. You get bang for the buck. A Python code, essentially, as you are familiar with, so you just write Python code, and the compilation actually happens on the on the board itself or the micro Python environment, and, and the and the compilation would uh, generate bytecode which is actually executed by the virtual machine, and the virtual machine actually runs on the machine code. So the, obviously, there are like a little bit of indirection, and then there is scope for like inefficiency. There is, like, there is some scope for inefficiency when you compare it with the traditional C and uh, C environment, actually. So why do we still want to use MicroPython? Yeah, let's think about some of the arguments. So it's, it's said that there is like 30% less development time, essentially. You get a board, you just connect it, you write your Python code, and then you, you just dump it. Uh, so there is like 30%, you, you can execute your customer requirements very quickly, and then there is also easier time onboarding uh, with Python than going through the traditional C, C++ code base and dealing with the whole compilation errors and the whole thing. And then you also don't have to deal with memory and uh, memory corruption and everything. Yeah, I have spent like a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of days actually, uh, overwriting a buffer and then the program crashes unpredictably, you don't know, you'd have to use uh, where are you overwriting everything? So you, you get all this like predictable behavior and everything at a, at a slight cost, essentially. And uh, nowadays, right, essentially, the hardware is also improving. Yeah, even though the Moore's law is like coming to an end for high-end processors, the low-end processors are still improving. We are still uh, seeing higher performance in processors and everything. Uh, and then uh, there are also like deeper sleep modes which are uh, being introduced in the processors essentially the processors can can consume very like uh, nano amperes of power do some work and get back to you so you need, you need not uh, they, they are being more efficient with respect to power and everything so this is uh, this is an incentive to be little bit less efficient on the code side yeah and then yeah there are some uh, let's talk about some of the workarounds which you can do to like uh, to close the gap between like C and Python to make uh, to so that it can work much more effectively. One is called cross compilation. So uh, as I previously mentioned, the compilation happens on the on the on the MicroPython environment on the board, right? This need not be. So MicroPython provides a cross compiler where you can just compile it on the host itself, and then you can so you can bypass that whole like two or three stage, uh, the whole like compilation phase actually. And uh, you can also do some optimizations, like normal code optimizations, like loop unrolling. There are some like MicroPython guidelines, essentially. Because we are operating in a limited environment, right? There are some guidelines about with respect to using variable length and all that. To, you can do some of that to gain, to, to gain some performance advantage. And then we'll talk about some of the, uh, some of the other, other things which you could do to optimize MicroPython code. 
So, so the first thing before optimization is to identify critical sections of the code, right? So we can use something like a timed time. You can we can time our functions essentially, and then initially instrument functions to see how much time are they taking and uh, where are we taking the major hit, so that we could attack that particular part of code and then improve the improve that code actually. So one, once we have a particular function which is uh, problematic or which is taking more time, right? So the, there is a decorator de called micropython.native. This, this one will directly, instead of going through the Python, right? This would directly, the compiler would directly uh, generate native code, essentially. So you're like bypassing two or three layers in the stack. And then there is also ways to write inline assembly. You can just directly write machine code within Python. So uh, let's say you want to add some registers, or you want to be more uh, optimistic. Let's say a particular uh, uh, particular edition is taking a lot of time, or the particular edition is too costly. You can just directly write assembly code, and then you can mix and match Python and assembly so that you are like much more. Uh, you get the best of both worlds. Let's say even you are still not satisfied. Then there is a there is a way to mix both Python and C actually. So you can actually write uh, external C modules. And then you can just import them. Like, for example, C example is a C file. You can just import them within Python. And then uh, you can uh, call functions, actually. So they're like different uh, ways of uh, uh, flexibility. And uh, yeah, there is a trade-off between flexibility and uh, like usability and then portability and everything. So once you write assembly code, right, this is, then you are getting into a territory where uh, you are writing machine-specific code. With, this may not be compatible with like, other architectures and everything. Yeah, yeah. So we talked about MicroPython. Let's also talk about Circuit Python. So Circuit Python is also another uh, fork of MicroPython. This was created by a company called uh, Adaf Adafruit. They sell like a lot of boards, and then they have their community, big community online, and everything. So the Adaf the Circuit Python is more catered towards uh, beginners and uh, towards educational uh, things, education and makers and everything. Whereas MicroPython is more catered towards essentially general purpose and then, so MicroPython has like greater support for multi-threading whereas CircuitPython will try to trade off uh, what you call advanced functionality for uh, usability and everything actually. So this is a minor difference. And then there is a growing ecosystem of uh, the boards and everything. Essentially, there are like 150 plus boards which are supported for MicroPython, 400 boards which are being supported on on Circuit Python, and then many libraries, many standard libraries are are uh, being available uh, for MicroPython, which are being ported from RC Python. So yeah, there are some examples. Uh, these are some of the two examples which we, which are being used, which where MicroPython is being used to teach kids for uh, teaching programming and everything. One is called a MicroBrit. This is a, a, a this is this was a very successful program. This is an initiative by BBC to essentially to make kids from age eight to fourteen learn programming and stuff. This is a the photo is a board essentially. So MicroPython was supported and was one of the supported languages which was which was helping kids to learn programming. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation was also helping uh, kids learn with uh, Raspberry Pi Pico using. MicroPython and everything. So this is like a, you, you can see that uh, if kids are doing it right, any, anybody can do it and you guys should also get a board. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so there are also many, uh, many people are also using uh, MicroPython for industry applications. So not everybody wants to uh, uh, go with like a cheaper board or essentially so the, if we consider if considering the trade-offs right you can def you can use let's say you are not uh, you are from a non-technical background and you want to easily develop an application right so MicroPython you, you could trade off some of the uh, what do you call performance with uh, by using MicroPython to build your application quickly and then probably uh, that can offset some of your like uh, development costs and and you can easily build applications. So some of the guidance which has been in the community is that you can quickly prototype uh, anything you want in MicroPython, then you can optimize the application. If it still doesn't meet your requirements, or like let's say sometimes MicroPython has uh, minimum requirements on the CPU and power and everything. So let's say you want to reduce the cost of the material, or like, you are not able to find that balance, then you can probably do a rewrite in C, essentially. So this is it has been the guidance in the community so far. So yeah, I just want to quickly cover some of the other uh, other places where Python is also being used and some of the other applications probably. So yeah, so till now we talked about systems where uh, Python is running directly on the microprocessor without any operating system and everything. So Python is also, uh, 
So Python is also very helpful in systems running full Linux, essentially. This is a Raspberry Pi, uh, the, the bottom one. And then this is much more powerful. This is similar to a Linux machine. So and Python can still be used to develop embedded applications. There are like many libraries which are available to access the uh, GPIO ports, I2C, serial ports, and everything. So, so Python can also be used with an operating system or without an, uh, an operating system. So in fact, there are like many applications which use like full Linux systems, for example, in networking equipment, where uh, Python is being used for uh, doing packet analysis and throughput, throughput analysis, bandwidth analysis, and essentially, so Python's uh, powerful libraries are being used utilized in like uh, full Linux systems as well. And then Python is also helpful in industrial automation, where you could control processes, monitor PL PLCs, do quality control, and a lot of those as well, actually. So yeah, this is another exciting thing, actually. So when we think about uh, AI on the edge, right? So when we think about machine learning, machine learning only happens on like big data centers with uh, with fans spinning and everything, right? So there is this new area called TensorFlow Lite. So this is an area where uh, the models uh, of the size of like kilobytes, right, are being uh, deployed on microcontrollers. The microcontrollers also have sensing needs. For example, you can only do so much. With, and traditionally, what you would do is you would get a noisy signal, you would do filtering, you would do some digital signal processing and everything. But with the help of like models like this, right, you can do you can be much more intelligent. You can uh, you can do much more powerful processing and everything. So essentially, I think uh, Python uh, with Python you can easily do this. And then uh, there is also a training side of things. So Python is also helpful you uh, for training these models and then redeploying them on microcontrollers or of uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, one more library which I want to cover is uh, MQTT. This is the this is unlike HTTP, which is like uh, fine with browsers and everything. MQTT is the protocol of Internet of Things. So Python has like good support in both MicroPython and uh, traditional C Python. You can easily use this to connect uh, any any device or like any Internet of Things or any embedded system to cloud. Uh, and everything, and then once you connect to cloud, you have your data, you have your web applications, you have your data crunching and everything. So uh, yeah, I think these are the three things which I want to cover. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? OK, anyone have a question? Hi, you talked about uh, using MicroPython on Raspberry Pi Picos. How does it work on like AVRs and even smaller microcontrollers? Yeah, yeah, there is uh, support for there's a list of microcontrollers where uh, the the, the micro control, MicroPython port is available, essentially. So there is an I'm not sure on if, whether it's available on that particular thing, but it's uh, uh, available on like most commonly used micro. Controllers, essentially, yeah. What kind of speed uh, problems do we get compared to like C? Is there any kind of comparison with that, or? Uh, I think if you write it naively, it can be pretty slow actually. But if you are like cognizant of uh, all the, uh, if you if you write it intelligently and optimize it, then you can. Uh, yeah, you have to be a little bit m mindful of what you're doing, and essentially, yeah. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm pretty new to embedded systems, uh, but this was all really interesting, just seeing how Python is evolving to enable more capabilities yeah. on embedded systems. Are there any particular applications of Python in embedded systems that excite you? Yeah, I think this one, right? The tiny ML, tiny TensorFlow Lite, right? This is uh, really exciting. Uh, you can train, essentially. So traditionally, with an accelerometer, right? Let's say you want to do some guesser detection or anything. It's really difficult. You get like a lot of noise. You have to do some signal processing, Fourier transforms, and all that. So I think it, it's really easy. It's really simple, essentially. You need not have complicated math to do. Let's say you can train an accelerometer data like this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you can build a model, and then you can use it right away. So I think this is pretty exciting. You can a uh, lot of applications can come up in this space using uh, yeah. They're talking about like models 
which are like pretty small essentially. They compromise uh, accuracy at the cost of like uh, speed and size essentially. Yeah. Uh, a, pre a pretty interesting talk. Uh, I just had two questions. Uh, one is, is MicroPython using the simple scripting uh, paradigm for programming? Uh, and secondly, how efficient is the garbage collection uh, for MicroPython? Yeah, I yeah, I think it, it uses the same like Python, uh, same Python language which you are familiar with. Uh, most of the uh, around 80% of the uh, you should not see any difference when you are like writing a Python code on MicroPython essentially. So garbage there there is an issue where you can run into like uh, memory fragmentation and stuff essentially. But I haven't seen in my experience with uh, uh, yeah the, you could run into problems with garbage collection. You have to be like little bit uh, more cognizant. But uh, I haven't practically seen them. Yeah, probably if you are like running a high-end uh, application using a lot of memory and uh, reading and writing, uh, 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 creating objects dynamically, then this could potentially be thing which you have to like consider, yeah. When you are in your edit debug cycle, do you do it on the embedded device, or is there a convenient way to do it on your laptop where you see sort of the similar timing, similar environment? Uh, well, could you repeat that? What is that? Yeah. Do you do your edit debug cycle on the embedded device, the small processor, or can your laptop sort of emulate that? Can yeah, it? yeah. You, you can run the same MicroPython on your laptop. Essentially, you need not have the hardware and everything. I, I think there is an uh, one exciting thing which is happening is they're trying to run MicroPython within a browser, actually. MicroPython is so lightweight that it, the, you can actually run scripts with the MicroPython runtime in the browser itself. So you can. Uh, easily run it on your computer, yeah. 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 Um, we, we still have time for a few more questions. The next talk is at 4.45. Yeah. Um, are you aware of any companies that use MicroPython in the production? Yeah, there are like many companies uh, which are, uh, there is a German company, at least from my research, which is trying to build a uh, uh, traffic monitoring system uh, using MicroPython. Uh, there is someone who is trying to build uh, oceanographic buoys and stuff using MicroPython. So, and then, uh, yeah, there are like many companies, right? Essentially, uh, the cost the cost of cost is like minimal for most of the things. Essentially, even if you use a costlier processor, you can easily run MicroPython, and that may not be that may not uh, really add up when you uh, come to, when you build the end product, right? Essentially, a couple of cents and a couple of dollars may not be may not be, if you are not, not uh, like pinching for pennies, then probably you, you can trade off that with uh, faster development time and uh, de debuggability, portability, and all that, yeah. And are there any security concerns of using MicroPython versus C? Security, uh, yeah, I'm not, not really yeah, familiar with the security aspect specifically. But I wouldn't assume, yeah, I wouldn't assume. Yeah, one thing to consider is that uh, probably uh, the code base, right, essentially. So MicroPython, I think it has like uh, one possibility is like bugs in code and everything. So MicroPython has good coverage with respect to tests and everything. I think they have like more than 90% coverage of the core uh, things. Uh, and then probably, yeah, one concern could be that probably if you use like a mic. A, a, a ported uh, ported library from a third party, which is like not uh, with somebody from out in the wild, right? In on GitHub, if you, there is a possibility that it could lead to some security concerns and stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.